Let's take a walk through Psalm 7. I've had a specific request from the class for this one, namely to clarify the distinction between a poetic line and a poetic phrase, which we will do as we journey through the psalm. So this is a Shigayon of David. We don't know what a Shigayon is. It's a fairly good guess that any time a Hebrew word is simply transliterated, that the translators don't quite know the meaning. It is some psalms genre, some ancient genre of psalm of David clearly attributes the authorship to David. And this one has a historical setting, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. Benjaminite. Now we don't know exactly where this fits into the life of David, because Cush the Benjaminite is not mentioned in the historical accounts. We do know that the Benjaminites, they were the tribe of Saul, and they were often loyal to Saul and hostile to David. So as we read through the psalm, the words of Cush a Benjamite appear to be some kind of a slanderous attack upon David. What type of psalm is this? It is very clearly a lament psalm, yet another lament psalm, the last in a string of five lament psalms, beginning from Psalm 3. And again, you're going to find, O oh Lord my God, that opening hint at invocation is a clue. But as we read through the psalm, you'll see that this is clearly a petition of a psalmist in crisis. This particular psalm quite nicely fits the five categories of lament psalms. So they typically include an invocation. They often include a description of the problem, the lament itself a petition, a prayer for what they want God to do, an expression of confidence in the Lord, and frequently conclude with a vow to praise. Now this one follows those five elements quite closely. The opening strophe, verses 1 and 2, is our invocation, and we get a hint at the problem here as well. O Lord my God, in you I take refuge, save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending, rendering, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. So he is being pursued by enemies. The context of persecution may emerge and he is taking refuge in God, praying for God to be his deliverer. The second strophe lays out a hint of the problem and also tells us a subspecies of lament that we're looking at here. This is a psalm in which the psalmist depicts himself as innocent of the accusations being made against him. And his appeal for God's help is based on his innocence. The accusations are false. O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is any wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without a cause, then, implied, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. So there's a clear implication here that someone has accused David of wrongdoing and David protests his innocence by calling down curses upon himself, in effect, if he's guilty. So if I have done this, if I've done this, if there's wrong in my hands, if I've repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without a cause, let the enemy, as the invitation for God to judge him if he's guilty, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. So it's a, it's a lament, specifically a psalm of innocence. And this is the problem. So the, the crisis that gives rise to the prayer is a false allegation. Now the ESV divides the next strophe differently to how I would have done it. I would treat verses 3 to 9 as one group, and they are the petition that the psalmist makes. They his prayer. What does he want God to do? Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. 
over it, return on high. What does he want God to do? He wants God to arise as judge, to gather the peoples and to render a just verdict in this dispute. Verse 8, the Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness. There's that protestation of innocence again. According to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end. May you establish the righteous who test the minds and hearts. O righteous God. So the petition in the psalm is that God, as a righteous judge, would intervene and would render his righteous verdict, which the psalmist knows is going to be in his favor because he knows that he is right in the situation. That's the petition. And so for my money, I would treat six through nine as one strophe and would, would treat it as the petition portion of the psalm. 10 and 11, as well as 12 through 16, portray the psalmist's confidence that God is going to intervene, vindicating him and rewarding his enemies with the justice that they deserve. So notice the tone of confidence here. He's presented his petition and he's confident in God's righteous intervention. My shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. So firstly, his confidence is in God's character, the kind of God that he is. He is his shield. He saves the upright. He's the God who saves. He's a righteous judge and he's a God who feels indignation against wickedness. Then a second element to his confidence is that God is the God who returns. He causes us to reap what we sow. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. In other words, God's going to arise as an avenger. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies, he makes a pit, he the wicked man, digging it out and falls into the hole he has made, his mischief returns on his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. David is confident that the law of sowing and reaping will be applied to his enemies who are unjustly attacking him. And then the psalm ends with a vow to praise in verse 17. I will give thanks to the Lord. Sorry, I will give the Lord the thanks due his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. So confident that Yahweh will arise as a righteous judge, render the verdict in his favor, punish his enemies, David vows to praise the Lord for his righteousness. You'll notice the language of righteousness is prevalent throughout the psalm, as is the language of judging and judgment. So these are the dominant images. There's a, a judicial tone and vocabulary to Psalm 7. So if we summarize it, what's going on here? The psalmist cries on the Lord to hear him and help him. Then he presents the problem. He's being falsely accused of wickedness. His petition is that God would arise in his role as judge and vindicate the righteous and punish the wicked. His confidence is that God will do exactly that. He will be the one who saves the upright and feels indignation towards the wicked. That will mean the law of sowing and reaping applies to those who have birthed wickedness. And as a result of that, the psalmist vows to give the Lord the praise that's due to his righteousness and to sing praise to his name. Now, I promise to clarify the difference between a poetic line and a poetic phrase. The first thing to know here is that you mustn't think of a grammatical line or a grammatical phrase. You also mustn't think of a physical line. So a physical line of text would be just this. That's not what we mean by a poetic line. 
A poetic line is one entire poetic thought. So typically, it would consist of two or three phrases. Most modern translations, as the ESV does, will help you to recognize this by beginning each new poetic line hard against the left margin. So in this particular strophe, there are three poetic lines. Why? How do we know that? Well, verse 3 begins hard against the margin. Verse 4 begins hard against the margin. And verse 5 begins hard against the margin. This is the ESV's way of signaling new poetic lines. The idea is that one poetic line, like a sentence in prose, contains one complete thought. A poetic line typically consists of two poetic phrases. Now, they are not grammatical phrases. And the way that the ESV and many other modern translations signal this is that they print each phrase on a separate line, and then within a poetic line, they indent the second and third phrases. So if we look at verse 3, it's one poetic line, with two phrases. Phrase one, O oh Lord my God, if I have done this. That's a poetic phrase. If there is wrong in my hands, that's another poetic phrase. And the layout shows that these two phrases belong together. Verse five is a single poetic line. You can see this one has three phrases though. Let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. That's phrase one. Let him trample my life to the ground, that's phrase two, and lay my glory in the dust, that's phrase three. The ESV shows that this is a single line of poetry by having only the first, only 5a, the first phrase hard against the left margin. Subsequent poetic phrases are on new lines of text, but they're indented to show that they combine with 5a to make a single poetic line consisting of three phrases. When we speak of things like synonymous parallelism, the idea is that the individual phrases that make up a poetic line parallel each other. They echo each other in some way. Synonymous parallelism, like verse 5, will have them being similar. They're expressing similar ideas, usually with some kind of newness or, or climax built across them. So let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life to the ground. You can see it's the same basic idea, but it's escalating. And lay my glory in the dust. So this would be synonymous parallelism. I hope that helps. If we look at the next trophy, verse 6 is portrayed in the ESV as having three poetic phrases but the entire verse is a single poetic line. So that's one poetic line with three phrases. Phrase one, arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift up against, <clears throat> lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me, you have appointed judgment. Three phrases, one line. Verse seven is again one line, but it's only got two phrases. So the easiest way to identify poetic lines and phrases is to use a translation that lays them out like the ESV does. The NIV will do it exactly the same way, as will many other translations, but not all. I'm going to flick through a few translations just to show you. This is the Christian Standard Bible. It prints each phrase hard against the left margin, so it doesn't signpost where each new line begins. The Net Bible does the same, but the modern English version, like the ESV and the NIV, will put the first phrase of each line further to the left and then indent subsequent phrases. Similarly, the New Living Translation, but not the Lexham English Bible, and so we could go through. So I hope that clarifies what poetic lines and phrases are, and hope you've enjoyed our walk through Psalm 7.